So St. Tikhon, throughout his first year as patriarch, uh, will preach repentance to the people as the key, the cornerstone of avoiding further descent into uh, chaos and destruction will be, the cornerstone will be repentance. And this is what all true preachers of the gospel will do. This is a sign for all of us as well. When we hear the preaching of repentance, then we know that we have a true disciple. When, when there's no preaching of repentance, when there's rationalism and justification, moralism and legalism and ritualism or whatever else that it might be, secularism, when we have a distortion of the life of the church, that almost immediately the preaching of repentance evaporates and disappears. And this is very characteristic of our time today. We do not hear among many Orthodox Christians even, but far, far more in the world generally, the need to repent, to change our ways, to return and to uh, mourn and to weep over uh, what we have in some way or another participated in, and that is the uh, the, the forgetting of God, as the patriarch would say, that Russian people had forgotten God. This is what he would say constantly in his encyclicals and in his preaching, that this has come about because the people have forgotten God. And he would rouse people, call people constantly to come to knowledge of their sins, self-knowledge, and to repentance. This is the key in the spiritual life generally, but how much more in a time like this. In a speech of New Year's in 1918, he says, the past year has been a year of the building of the Russian realm, but alas, does it not remind us of the sad experiment of Babylonian building? And again, we have forgotten God. We have been hunting a new happiness, running after deceptive shadows. We've gotten drunk on the wine of freedom, the church condemns such building, such building of ours, and we warn most decisively that there will be no success until we remember God. I think this is noteworthy in the West as well. Of course, we have the same phenomenon without the persecution going on in the West for some time. This, this, this tru truly resembles a, the Babylonian insanity, of, right? Of, of building without God, ascending to both on the intellectual sphere, rational sphere, but in the in, in technocracy and all that that we're living, we're living a, an attempt, uh, not at the time of Babylon, not, in time, not unlike the, the communists and atheists. There really is not, spiritually speaking, a massive difference. There they persecuted and repressed and rejected God's even existence and wanted to wipe out his, his all of his work in society. Here, they persecuted in a much more subtle and deceptive ways. The demons persecute those Christians who work to live uh, a life pleasing to God and not drunk on the wine of freedom, as he says, right? I'm not licensed to do whatever you like, but to be free from sin. This is the true freedom in the church. So the church condemns this building of utopia, this Babylonian building. Church condemns it in every society, including the West. Church condemns the spirit of the social gospel trying to create a heaven on earth, uh, which is very much a part of the communist plan and the utopian, all the utopian schemes going back hundreds of years, including this, we have to say it and be honest, this utopian scheme of America and the, the West. This city on a hill, this uh, pursue your the American dream. All of this is a part of a worldliness and a desire for building on earth a heaven, uh, which is the perennial temptation of humanity. It's exactly the lie of the enemy in the garden to Adam and Eve. I Be mean, gods without God. That's what they try to do in Babylon. That's what they try to do with every utopia. So these words are applicable to us in the West and all throughout the world it's because today, especially after 30 years after the fall of communism, what do we have but the same spirit now all throughout the world? 
the system, the oppressive system has fallen, but has the spirit changed? Have they repented of that spirit? Have they repented of their Babylonian building? Have they repented of their being drunk on the wine of freedom, not true freedom, from passions and sin and death, but freedom from, uh, freedom to rather, to be licentious, to be, to be, uh, to indulge one's passions. That kind of freedom is slavery, actually. So this is a very, very timely uh, stance. This is what we need today. Preachers of repentance from this delusional uh, utopian stance of many Christians, right? That put the church at the service of the world. The church will now help us to achieve prosperity, peace in an external way, security in an external way. The church will be at the service. This is the spirit of Antichrist. And it's very much alive in the world today. At the outset of the Domitian Fast now, in the 1st of August, he again pleads with the Russian people and he says, this terrible and exhausting night still continues in Russia, and no joyous dawn is to be seen in it. Our fatherland succumbs to fierce tortures, and there is no remedy that can heal it. So where is the cause of this continued illness that throws some into apathy, others into despair? Sound familiar? Many are in despair today. Many, many have become apathetic. Uh, others have, rous have, have arisen to the challenge and become more faithful. So it does depend on one's disposition. But there are many who are in despair today. Many perhaps who've walked away from the church or are scandalized by the church leadership. In a way, this, this distortion in the West is far worse than what initially they were experiencing in communist Russia. The attack, uh, the bloodshed is, of course, throughout church history, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Right? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So in some ways, this persecution is preferable spiritually speaking to what many many experience in the west today i should say in the west all around the world there really is no more west east it's all been united in the same worldly spirit um he says to find an answer to this question question your orthodox conscience and in it you will find the answer to the vexing question it will tell you that the sin that weighs over us is the source of all your ills and misfortunes. Sin has disintegrated our land. Sin has led the Lord to deprive us, according to the word of the prophet, of the staff and the rod and all the strengthening of bread, of the courageous leader and warrior, for the judge and the prophet and the wise, of the judge and the prophet and the wise elders. Sin has darkened the reason of our people, and so we are groping in darkness. Without light and totter like drunkards, sin has fanned everywhere the flames of passion, hostility, and ire. Brother risen against brother, prisons are filled with captives, the earth is soaked, the earth is soaked in innocent blood, shed by brotherly hand, polluted by violence, pillaging incest, and other infamies. Sin, heavy and unrepentant, has summoned Satan from the abyss, this is obviously a reference to the book of Revelation. Satan is summoned from the abyss and he has now been bellowing his lies at the Lord and his church and is inaugurating an open persecution of the church. So here is a true evangelical Orthodox Christian preaching of repentance and calling people back to the basics of the spiritual life. And this missing of the mark, and what is the mark? That's what sin means. Sin is a missing of the mark. What is the mark? The mark, of course, is purification from that which obstructs communion. And communion being the ultimate mark, that's, the, that's salvation. And so turning away from that communion and indulging oneself and becoming defiled by the things that were created for the good pleasure of man and for his union with God now have been used against that and in spite of that and indifference to that purpose of life. This is sin. This is the missing of the mark. And so the rights, we could say in another, another using more St. Paisius kind of language, the rights of the, we have given rights to the enemy. 
They've given rights to the enemy for, for him now to take power over us and to rule over us. This is how things work in the spiritual life. So it's calling us to self-knowledge. It's calling us to repentance. And this is the source of all the ills and the misfortunes. And St. Tikhon goes on preaching repentance. He says in, other, in the same talk later on, Oh, who will give our eyes the necessary tears to bewail all the ills that have been begotten by our national sins and lawlessness? The obscuring of the glory and beauty of our fatherland, the impoverishment of the land and exhaustion of the spirit, the destruction of towns and villages, the reviling of churches and holy relics, and all that shattering self-annihilation of the great of a great people that made it into a horrible and shameful spectacle for the whole world. It's not an accident that he talks about annihilation because I think what really was going on and is going on in the world and has been going on for some time is nihilism and loss of all kinds of meaning in life. When you lose any connection to a eternal life and the meaning of life can only be found in eternity, well, then everything else is going to lead to a nihilism, a meaninglessness. And so it's not an accident. He says the shattering self-annihilation of a great people that made it into a horrible and shameful spectacle for the whole world. Um, he does not simply condemn in a political reactionary way the particular Bolshevik bullies. He does that as well, of course. He, In other words, he condemns their actions. But you see that he actually is Preaching, preaching repentance to the Orthodox themselves, to the rest of society who are not actively involved, that this is this is what's led to this, right? We have nothing to do but weep deeply, first and foremost, for what has become of Russia, and one could apply it to all of us today in the West. Do we have tears? Do we have that stance that we are co-responsible. We talked about this last week. And every great teacher of the church will bring us to that stance. This is where we have to come. It's not enough for us to condemn the darkness. We have to take responsibility for our part in bringing about that darkness in the world. This is key. And um, this is true always, but it's even more true when you have a evil manifestation in public life, how much more is this the case and needs to be done? Finally, just some more excerpts from the preaching and teaching of St. Tikhon <clears throat> and the preacher of repentance. He says, where art thou formerly so mighty and sovereign Russian people? Hast thou completely outlived thy strength as a giant magnanimous and joyful. Thou hast fulfilled by great appointed path, heralding peace, love, and truth to all. And now thou lies smitten and cut down by thy enemies, burning up in the flames of sin, passion, and interseen hatred. Notice how he says, the enemies have cut thee down and they're burn and you're burning up in the flames of sin passion. This is not unrelated to our own state, right? Uh, the strength has been lost precisely because the rights have been given to the enemy, right? This is the, this is again the the message of the of the patriarch. Is it possible that thou will not surge up again, spiritually rise again in power and glory? Has the Lord forever deprived thee? Deprive thee of the sources of life. Extinguish thy creative power in order to cut thee down like a barren tree. May this not be so. The mere thought of it makes us shudder. The mere thought of it makes us shudder. Weep, dear country. Bewail the heavy sins of our fatherland before it has perished completely. Weep for yourselves and for those who became of their hardened hearts have not, who, who because of their hardened hearts have not the grace of tears. So again, it's very, very instructive. 
teaching us to weep not only for our sins, but for the sins of the fatherland, and even for the sins of those who have no tears. Weep for them as well. So there's a collective and a mutual responsibility. Very clear here. Some people say, uh, well, this evil thing is happening in our life, in our parish, in my family. What should I do? And there are times when it's better not to be involved, depending on the dynamics there. But there are many times when it is called to be involved. If it's a communal, common uh, affliction that, that is a scandal to all of us in the community, well, then we're, we're called to be involved in that and to solve it, right? We cannot be indifferent to that. So this is another, you're in a parish, you're in a community, and you see that perhaps in, this will increase in our days. Priests, for lack of understanding, priests for lack of right teaching, priests for lack of courage, priests for lack of catechism, whatever it might be, clergy, leaders, whatever it might be, they're scandalizing the faithful with their actions. Are we not co-responsible for that situation? Uh, there are a variety of things one could point to. I mean, COVID and all of its accompanying insanity. If certainly, there are many examples that I've heard and you've given through these lectures of the last year. But even on a more basic level, on moral and, and, and issues, when you have immorality on, on a level of a communal, then it's, and, it's, and it's manifest. And there is a, 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 sim, a seemingly a wink toward that immorality because the, the priest or the people don't want to face forthrightly the sin for, la, for, for their own uh, lack of conviction or out of some kind of worldliness they don't want to offend or whatever it might be. And we see all this. Are we not co-responsible? In other words, this is an extreme example in the life of the church in Russia. We have this nihilism, this Golgotha that they, they were living through. But it's a, true on many levels in our own life that we're called to feel and weep for our brothers and sisters, but also act in positive ways. Uh, if possible, intercede ourselves. It's, it's, it's not a one-dimensional thing. We just go to our room and weep, and that's it. No, it's weep, pray, have pain of heart, and, and act, and act, depending on the circumstance with discernment. It's all necessary. And that's exactly what you're seeing here from the hierarchy and from St. Tikhon is exactly that. There was actions, defend, uh, respond, uh, show faith, and there was also calls to repentance, calls to weeping, calls to um, pain and suffering uh, with with all. So it, it's 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 a multifaceted spiritual life. It's not one dimensional, and we all need to be. And it's on a, on all levels, right? Small and large uh, levels. It's not just on the ma the massive issues of people today tend to talk. Well, this is not a dogmatic issue, so we don't have to talk about it. We don't have to deal with it. That's just None of our business. But this whole distinction is this shark, uh, stark distinction between dogma and ethos. Yes, it exists on a theoretical level. But in real life, it doesn't exist. There's no like demarcation line. Oh, now it's dogma and now it's ethos. It's one life, right? And so let's not be confused with thing because it's not an extreme, it's not an obvious ex and ex uh, extremely, um, um, you know, well-known dogmatic issue about the person of Christ, the Holy Trinity, that therefore I, I'm just going to live a individualistic spiritual life and go about my business. This is insane. There are many other challenges of the church life that we are co-responsible for on many levels. Uh, the ethos and, the, and the, the teaching of the church, for instance, about marriage and about immorality is a dogmatic issue ultimately. Right, it's a part of the revel revelation of Jesus Christ as to how to live in Christ. Uh, everything that dis distorts and 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 takes away the Christian from the narrow path ultimately is a kind of heresy. Right? I mean, there's there's levels or degrees and categories of heresy, but the problem 
with, that with heresy is not in and of itself uh, the error. That's not the main problem. The main problem is that it takes us away from communion with God. 